Being made in the image and nature of God means that we are necessarily social. Why? Because God is a trinity. That's why. And we are social in nature, as John Paul pointed out, because we only grow as humans by giving ourselves in love to others. We need other people in order for us to be fully human. And any theory or approach to economics that looks at the individual as an atomistic uh, unit. And in economics, we have the individual has his preferences, he has his income, his preferences, which are unique and given. His DNA tells him what he likes and doesn't like. He has his income, and he has prices. And that's all we're allowed to consider. And then you let the models take care of everything else. And also, in neoclassical economics, the ultimate goal is utility and consumption. And of course, no Christian could accept that. In neoclassical economics, we assume people are driven solely by self-interest, but no Christian can accept that. Okay, so in Catholic Social Law, we have a set of principles to guide, and I'm sure that most people are very familiar with these principles, so I'm not gonna go over them, but this is our yardstick. This is what we measure. Does an economic system, uh, is it justified? Is it doing what it should be doing? Is the economy working for the people, or are the people working for some economic forces or those with economic power? Markets can do great things, and nobody who knows anything about economics would deny that markets aren't a very useful tool. They're a very efficient institution for allocating goods and services, and no one would claim otherwise. They're particularly good at small things, at small issues, a small change in price. The price of gasoline goes up 50 cents, the market sends the right signals. It would be ridiculous for the government to interfere with that. That's what markets are designed to do. But what, where they run into problems is when you get big changes. The price of gasoline goes up 400%, as it did in the 70s. The market's not going to react right to that, so we had to step in and do alternate day uh, gas purchases on your license plate, odd and even days. Because if we let the market just do it, it would have gotten out of hand. As we saw gas prices last summer, speculation takes over and rationality is left. That's the time for the government to step in and try to see, does this reflect real fundamental uh, economic forces? And also, the market is not good at promoting ethical decisions. That if it's, as Adam Smith pointed out, if I'm acting, I'm going out and buying a pair of shoes, it doesn't involve anyone else, I should follow my self-interest, no one can complain about that. But if I'm going to do an economic act that will harm somebody else, Adam Smith teaches us, you have to step up to a higher plane of ethics. You can't rely on, 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 on economic logic or economic ethics and self-interest, but you have to step up and go to philosophy and theology to be guided on how should I act when my actions might harm someone else. And this is, back, this is just what Catholic social thought is suggesting. So in the democratic socialist tradition, what we do is, or what they've done, is look at, well, where are the market failures? Where has the market not worked in a way that leads to the common good? And the big examples are unemployment, continuous problem throughout the history of advanced capitalist economies, and right now. Inequality and poverty, again, a continuous problem. If you let the market forces, and that is those with power exercise free reign they will get richer and the poor will get poorer. It's always happened. There are no counterexamples. Where we see the opposite happening, where we see the bottom in the middle class grow, there we see government intervention somehow. We see this in, in the work law, factory acts, and the various regulations in England, turning the tide in terms of rising wages during the Industrial Revolution. We see this with the New Deal after World War II in the United States. In Europe, where the bottom came and grew faster than the top, and then when we switched that in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, the opposite happened. The bottom falls, the top rises. Most importantly, the market does not do good with, does not handle risk and uncertainty. This is the central theme in John Maynard Keynes, the uh, general theory of interest, employment, and money. When we're dealing with future-oriented decisions, when there's great uncertainty, you'll have great instability. And you have to build in ways 
to limit the uncertainty, to limit the, the instability. We removed all of those, lastly, in 1999, when we allowed for the bucket laws to come, the bucket system to come back and allowed the financial sector to be geared towards gambling instead of prudent investment in wealth creation that creates well-being. Uh, instead, we promoted wealth creation that created wealth creation, which eventually led to wealth destruction, uh, which, of course, was what happens when you create wealth and there is no well-being. And in terms of the problems of the environment, again, you have the problem of, in, in this case, you have the huge problem of property rights uh, is one of the problems. Uh, and when you have collective effects or externalities, when my action affects people who aren't part of my economic transaction, and of course global warming is the ultimate externality, all sorts of people are being affected by economic activity that they've had no role in. All the people living in the Pacific Islands who have their very nations and their, their, lively, their lives threatened right now because the sea level's going up, and the shrinking these islands. They're not part of our economic system. They played no role in creating all this pollution, yet they will be affected greatly. So when you have that situation, then you have to have some way of taking into their consideration, into, into consideration their well-being, because the market only looks at who has the right in the marketplace. And typically that's the buyer and the seller. But if someone else is being affected, you have to consider, take into consideration. Also, public goods. There are a lot of uh, things that are necessary for the economy and for social well-being that the market is not going to provide. Adam Smith noted this when he talked about the importance of national defense, law and order, and public works projects, roads, bridges, et cetera. Well, in the 20th century, I think we could safely add education, and healthcare to those lists, that these are uh, things that are vitally important to all of society, yet the market has not been able to adequately provide this for everyone. And lastly, I have slides actually on each of these. I even have a graph on one of them just to prove I do have a PhD in economics, <laughs> just in case anyone wants to check my credentials. But lastly, the market, by encouraging self-interest, as not as a virtue, there's nothing wrong with being prudent, but as the virtue that trumps everything, that that is the guide, that our financial system should be based on managers maximizing shareholder wealth, and that's what drives our corporate system, that that is the virtue. Adam Smith knew that this eats away at public virtues, at social values. And this is why he paid so much attention to, in the moral sentiments, the role of religion, the role of developing conscience, et cetera. I would argue that our market economy and the world's market economy has been living off of the goodwill investment of Christian ethics for a very long time. Now, for most of this period, religion was still an important role, and that rebuilt, that, that refilled that well of ethics and values. But there's a reason why capitalism seems to work in Europe and the United States and in Christian countries. Because they had a sense of, I need to control myself. I need to not take advantage of people. I need to respect people's property. I should be honest, even when I can get away with it. Sure, there are people who violate it, but the vast majority of people would follow Christian ethics, and that is necessary for a free economy. As Chesterton said, a free society starts with people with, who control themselves. If I don't control myself, then we need a lot of policemen to control us. Well, that's true in our economic acts. We only allow freedom if we have self-control. But the self-control comes not from the market, it doesn't teach us this, it comes from religion, it comes from social ethics. And the market eats that away. And I would argue, and have argued many times, that moral relativity in postmodernism that's the philosophy of the marketplace. Everything is relative, because all that matters is what the consumer wants to choose. And that this, I would say, is one of the biggest threats to having a dynamic economy. Uh, the social